Neil Doherty here, Vice President of Marketing Communications at SRM, and uh, we're excited to have two leading voices on the ever-evolving topic of cryptocurrency with us today. So first, I wanted to introduce my colleague, Larry Press from SRM. He's our crypto lead. He's a self-titled crypto curious consultant and a featured speaker at financial services events across the country. So awesome to have Larry today. And joining him is Manolo Sanchez, uh, former chairman and CEO of BBVA Compass Bank, and certainly a leading voice in the, the world of fintech and cryptocurrency. Uh, Manolo, thanks for, for being here today and helping us out, um, talking through this. Uh, Manolo is an adjunct professor at the Jones Graduate School of Business at Rice University, and he uh, splits the remainder of his time across uh, various board posts and financial services and technology spectrum. So we're really excited to, to have Manolo here with us today. Um, and thank, thank you both for joining us. Uh, we're going to focus this chat on the general topic of cryptocurrency and more specifically on how financial institutions are maneuvering and adopting during what effectively is a meteoric rise of interest in cryptocurrency. So we'll go ahead and get started, uh, Larry Manolo, if that works for you guys. Uh, so first question, Larry, uh, maybe you can kind of start us out here is, you know, crypto is obviously a growing topic of interest for people around the world, but what are the latest trends or implications for banks and credit unions uh, and their strategic planning heading into 2022 when it comes to crypto? Yes, as you know, we talked to a lot of banks and credit unions. Uh, mass adoption is really what's impacting them. Uh, they're getting a lot of requests from their members and clients to provide custodial services, trading, rewards, borrowing options. Uh, turns out there's over right now about 70 million uh, unique crypto wallets in the world, about two to 300 million people holding uh, cryptocurrency and in about 20 to 25 percent of Americans of kind of investable age or with investable assets are directly invested in crypto and that's outside of like owning equities uh, uh, like Tesla stock or micro strategies um, and now most of that's the exchange space uh, held on exchanges so a lot of those Clients would really prefer to hold their keys with their trusted financial institution. There's been some studies from Visa as well as NIDIG that shows, again, that 80% of them would prefer to hold those keys at a trusted financial institution. So they don't have the risk of losing in the keys and access to crypto. Interesting thing is, is that majority of them, about 70% of them, would actually switch financial institutions to one that offered it, which leads you to the opportunity or leads banks and credit unions to opportunity of first mover advantage. And we saw that with Vast Bank. Uh, they launched uh, trading, uh, crypto trading back a few months ago. And within eight weeks, they increased their customer base by 25%. It took them eight weeks to grow their customer base by 25%. And that was a customer base that they built up over 40 to 50 years. So there's a huge early adopter uh, advantage for financial institutions that go that direction. Um, and those are the financial institutions, you know, those financial institutions that at least understanding that there's an opportunity are really scrambling to get solutions into the marketplace. And Manolo, anything that you would add when it comes to, you know, just thinking about the, you know, the strategic element of this and, you know, how banks and credit unions can look to, you know, basically, you know, find opportunities to integrate crypto uh, into their offering? Yeah, and I think, you know, maybe the, the, I'd like to reflect on really the two trends that are driving um, this uh, focus and this interest in adopting um, cryptocurrencies. One is clearly around the, um, the issue of the monetary um, environment we're in. I think it's no coincidence that people started paying attention to Bitcoin after the pandemic um, rescue packages, whatever they're called exactly, and they suddenly we've, the world found itself with a 10 year uh, running um, uh, asset that, that has a capped uh, supply at 21 million units and a known inflation on an annual basis of roughly right now around 2% at the current, um, at the current issuance of Bitcoin every 10 minutes. So this is really created, uh, we, I think most people have a hard time deciding what Bitcoin is, but it is it is looking like a reserve asset and that reserve asset is driving a lot of asset management interests. And you know, there are early movers here like Fidelity that's been doing this for a while. Uh, I mean, in the institutional side. Um, and with the idea that can we uh, protect uh, our, ourselves from this uh, potential inflation, this, this lack of trust in traditional fiat money that is there may be too much printing around it. And, and if you actually listen to some of, and on the corporate side, companies like MicroStrategies or Square and even Tesla when, when it did, uh, decided to hold Bitcoin on its balance sheet and for, for its treasury, 
uh, if you actually listen to to the the, the narratives around micro macroeconomics, <clears throat> Michael Saylor, if you listen to <clears throat> his talks on micro strategies and where they are invested in Bitcoin, is really all about what's uh, you know big uh, theoretical and academic debates around what's money and and you know is fiat money any better than than crypto and Bitcoin in particular. So I think that's the first the first trend I would I would underscore. And the second one is you know ten years running and and. Um, and, and some really, really talented people and a lot of, really a lot of money thrown into this. We have some very interesting infrastructure that's being developed. And the, the, I like to say the, the headline is, this is programmable money highways. And um, this is actually a new paradigm that um, some people call the, the, the internet of money or just generally the idea that you can create um, money, you know, that, that, that is uh, that is code that is programmable, and with with all that comes with that, uh, self-executing smart contracts that allow us to do all kinds of transactions, and, and that is, people are coming to terms with the infrastructure. As I say, it's been in the build in the building. It's been been over over uh, ever. I mean, if you think of Ethereum as as that second generation cryptocurrency that that creates this paradigm of programmable money. We're talking almost seven years in the making, and then all this layer of what they call Ethereum killers or this uh, other competing um, programmable blockchains uh, that are actually got an amazing rally this year, like Solana or um, Polkadot, or of course Cardano, which is probably the the earlier mover here. But what people are coming to terms is that this is not just people are obsessed with this means of exchange, store value, sort of what is. Uh, what is the functionality of an electronic cash as, as Satoshi uh, was intending to create it in the white paper. But ultimately what we're, we're getting is this amazing infrastructure that is very powerful and that is uh, has all these advantages of a decentralized world. So that's what's, I think people are coming to terms with these things. You know, a lot of people would like to say, this is a Ponzi scheme. So there was a lot of negativity and a lot of uh, bad rap. I think as people go sort of go through that, so we're able to weave around that and, and say, well, let's let's really learn what's going on here, and that's how we see all this financial institutional um, financial services world just coming to terms with that. I mean, and we, um, you know, there's uh, just maybe one last point is like, you know, by the time we have three trillion dollars in, in locked value in here, it's two point six today a trillion, but it, it was three trillion for a couple of days in recent times. You know, this starts to be meaningful as well for a lot of institutions and in saying, you know, why, why aren't we um, playing in this space, right? Right. And you raise a really interesting point about the infrastructure and kind of the programmable highways. And, and Larry, I know you've been tracking this for some time, but, you know, when you think about kind of the current state of adoption and, you know, in the banking credit union space, are there particular early adopters or some institutions that are, you know, really taking advantage of that infrastructure today? Any thoughts on kind of, you know, the sort of the, the, the elements and the, the examples that you've seen. Yes, there, there are early adopters. And, you know, as you mentioned, there was uh, some people get into it from a store value standpoint. Some people get in from a transactional, you know, a good example of transactional would be international remittances. Some people get it in from a speculative standpoint. You mentioned Solano, and I think that's up like 1600% year to date. So a lot of these financial institutions are being pushed by their clients, in particular, some of the invest uh, their their big institutional investors, to get exposure to cryptocurrencies. So some of the good examples, and, and there's about probably half a dozen in the market today. But what's important is we at least going to be a thousand are going to launch next year, which is going to be really a, a lot of financial institutions bringing crypto onto uh, at least offering crypto solutions. We've seen U.S. Bank launch with custodial services. I think one of the best examples in the market is Vast Bank. I mentioned them earlier, but they launched a, a trading platform as well as self-custody, uh, and they saw a huge increase in their uh, client base. Um, Quanek, uh, which is a New York-based bank, they had some very good success with the rewards programs, uh, debit and credit card rewards. When they've been offered in the marketplace, generally they've got wait lists of over 100,000 clients. Uh, we've got a good example would be Silvergate Bank. Um, Silvergate Bank uh, lends to the crypto industry. And in fact, they, they were able to increase their asset basis by over $10 billion in less than a year. And while that's interesting, they also uh, are, are the kind of the, the lender or lender, the 
the issuer for Stablecoin DM, um, which is Facebook's uh, Stablecoin, which I'll mention a little bit later, I think, in some comments, but uh, some news came out about that today. Uh, PNC looks like they're going to be issuing, potentially issuing some stable coins. Certainly, I think they're going to do some custodial services, maybe lending against crypto. Uh, JP Morgan already had uh, a lot of blockchain technology, but they had their own JP Morgan coin. They were using that to, to basically settle internationally, real time uh, final settlements. I could also mention New York Community Bancor. They, in the last week, it was announced they're minting a new stablecoin with a company called Figure Technologies. The stablecoin is called USDF, and it's on a blockchain called Providence, which allows lenders and investors to buy and sell loans in real time, 24-7, you know, seven days a week, 365 days a year, which is really the, the, the benefit of kind of some of these stablecoins and crypto solutions for financial institutions. And then uh, the, I'll mention also Signature Bank. Uh, they've got a stable coin called uh, TUSD, which is a partnership through two, uh, two US dollar running on a platform called Signet that allows real-time payments for their commercial clients. So unlike traditional funds that transfer between two banks, a blockchain allows funds transfer to happen directly between commercial clients and commercial entities. And what we're seeing is that a lot of these folks they want access to their money or their ability to move money immediately. We're seeing a lot of that in the venture capital space. And they're using stable coins to kind of fund new projects. So they don't have to wait over the weekend to wait for their bank to, to, to open in the morning. Or, you know, if God forbid someone is reviewing a, a wire and decides that they've got some questions about it and it gets delayed. You know, we're at the point now where when we move money, we expect it to be instantaneous. And, and these banks and credit unions are figuring that out. I mentioned Credit unions, uh, Unify uh, credit unions launching with support of the uh, institutional crypto platform provider NYDIG and mobile banking provider Q2. Similarly, uh, Visions Credit Union, we've been talking to them quite a bit, doing the same. They've got test transactions that they've already run, and I expect implementation later this year or, net, or, or next year. So we're seeing a lot of early adopters in this space with all the benefits of being an early adopter. We're going to see a lot of fast followers next year and i mean gosh even if you know instead of a thousand even 500 of them adopt and end up rolling out bitcoin uh as a as a trading option you can imagine what that's going to do to the market sure and you know larry and and a lot of those um examples you shared you talked a bit about stablecoin and manola i thought it might be a good opportunity to, to just get into that a little bit and talk a little bit about kind of the innovation behind stable coins and the uses and the advantages i know previously i've heard you reference stable coins as sort of the, the third generation of crypto. So I was hoping you might be able to kind of just, you know, sort of give us a, uh, an overview of that and your, your take on that. Yeah, I, I use this framework with my, with my students uh, when we talk about um, cryptocurrency, sort of the theme around uh, three generations or somehow a third generation of crypto is Bitcoin being the first one. Uh, really enabling uh, unique digital assets and the exchange of value and the second one being Ethereum and the generation of programmable, fully programmable cryptocurrencies. And the third really are, uh, I mean, one possible third is stable coins. There's other ones like privacy coins, but uh, uh, focusing on, on, on stable coins, is they, they, this is a generation of crypto that's trying to solve for the volatility, which is uh, inconvenient uh, to say the least when you are trying to get to this promised land of programmable money, you wanna execute a letter of credit on a smart contract and then you find out that, you know, as we're, as we're talking, this thing is, uh, you know, um, uh, fluctuating five, 10%. Sometimes it, it's, it's pretty, and pretty crazy, the, the volatility of this, uh, of these assets. So stable coins are, are solving for that. They are a bit of, you know, in the, in the community you hear, or, you know, it is the, the, kind of the anti-crypto in a way, because it's, uh, crypto is, is based on the centralized, uh, uh, central authority free and in in a in a, in a stablecoin typically you're going to need some uh, someone to verify or ideal as we've been seeing with some of the issues around the biggest stablecoin tether how there's uh, there's a need for an auditor and there's a need for a, a banking partner or an asset manager that can hold the uh, the fiat that's backing it particularly in the fiat collateralized ones right Although there's a great deal of innovation in stable coins, I mean, I would encourage anyone to really go down uh, this uh, this space because in addition to commodity collateralized uh, stable coins, there's actually crypto collateralized um, 
uh, cryptocurrencies, which is sounds pretty surreal, but it is some one of the most innovative areas of, of development is in that space, particularly with the um, DAI maker, which is the um, it's the, the stable coin that's uh, using Ethereum to over collateralize and create a stable coin. But I'm going to stick to the to the ones that are they're fiat collateralized. Therefore, they the back they're backing and they're giving you a parity of one say one dollar or one fiat unit per per crypto unit, and that is really what is um, really getting a lot of traction. I think stable coins, in my view. Um, you know, in addition to solving the, the volatility issue, which really uh, enables the ability to um, adopt all these uh, programmable financial transactions in a way that it takes out all this uncertainty um, and, and therefore expands potentially the application to many, many other types of transactions uh, that one can think of. Um, I think in addition to that, the issue with uh, this stable coins is also, it, it, it's, um, it's an oasis, if you will, for the crypto world. Think about, because the on-ramps and the off-ramps from crypto fiat are so clunky. I mean, think about, say that you have made uh, 600, or I don't know, if you bought Solana and you were saying earlier, Larry, I think 6,000%, whatever it is, some crazy amount of money, right? I'm not, I'm not into um, meme coins, so I won't even, I won't mention them as, a, uh, as, a, as an example of, the, the super and say, but let's say something serious uh, like a, a cryptocurrency that has some real infrastructure play and that has this valuation is really in the infrastructure and the, and the demand of it. Suddenly, the only way you can really uh, take a break from this volatility is, uh, is if you get off the, the crypto world into fiat again. And that means you have to go through your, uh, a bank uh, again, uh, you know, do the transaction, explain um, to your bank, you know, what this money is coming from, all the KYC. So it is, it is, it's kind of, I like to say that going to crypto is going to another galaxy. <clears throat> and so stable coins allow, uh, allow folks to have a fiat position in this other galaxy. <clears throat> so if you have this, you can trans, you can move away from a crypto position into a stable coin position very quickly. That explains in my view why Tether, which is the largest one, is almost $80 billion market cap. That means $80 billion of, of locked dollars. But even the um, USDC, the circle, um, stablecoin, which is the one that is, I would say is the most compliant to the U.S. <clears throat> a rule system uh, has about a $40 billion worth of, of market cap as well. So if these stablecoins are really serving a lot of purposes and it's really expanding um, the horizon of use cases. Uh, and we'll talk probably later about the so-called uh, you know, central bank digital currencies but I would, I would even uh, venture to say that these are already digital currencies. You know, folks are, are, we're obsessing about the digital yuan and other countries are piloting these digital currencies. But in a way, we already have a proxy of that. And certainly in the USDC and the Circle uh, and the Paxos version of this versus I mean, if we Tether, we want to somehow folks have uh, a way to think that Tether is, is not as reliable. But anyway, hopefully this sort of projects, uh, so sort of shares my views on this. I think that um, it, is, it is a very interesting space. And as Larry was saying earlier, folks are starting, people are wanna get, well, if I'm, I'm, I'm I know people that wanna get paid on USDC, uh, which is a circle uh, stable dollar without you know, any hesitation. There's no, why wouldn't you wanna take that? It's already a digital dollar. Yeah, go ahead, Larry. J jump yeah, in there. I can add to that. Yeah, so I'm just thinking from a use case scenario. Um, really, they're they're replacing in many countries, just like central bank digital currencies, kind of replacing current the current payment rails. So think about like Visa, Mastercard, American Express, Discover, but also wires, ACH, Jack Swift, um, and and you can do that because it's just really a digital dollar. It's a digital dollar. But think about if you're a merchant and you had the option of taking cash with all the carrying costs of cash and the fraud associated with the cash, or you could take a credit card, which got you know a merchant fee of three percent or whatever, or you could take a stable coin, which is like cash and that is instant final settlement, no risk of chargebacks, but you don't have any of the fraud or loss because your employees can take it out of the till. Why would I take stable coins and the, the fees for doing that transaction are next to nothing and the transaction settles on the blockchain instead of going through the traditional 
the traditional rails. That's got some real implications for those traditional networks, but also have real implications for banks and credit unions that get paid a slice of that merchant fee via interchange. So, you know, that's something to keep a real eye on is the implementation and the usage of stablecoin for everyday payments, not just movement of money, but actual payments. And, and Manolo, to your point, you know, why would you not get paid in, in stable coins? You know, you know, if a merchant got paid in stable coins, well, if they could pay their employees in stable coin, they could pay their vendors in stable coins. Because at any point in time, because it's stable, they could cash back out to U.S. dollars. And so it, uh, it's got some real impl interesting implications. Yeah, Manolo, you mentioned before, and we might as well just get right into it about central bank digital currencies. And I'm just kind of curious in terms of, you know, what future you see for for that? And, you know, what are some of the trends around that or, or some of the movements or timing even um, in your mind? It's hard to know. I mean, the, the, in some, there are some international developments, as you know, the Chinese uh, um, you, uh, digital currency, which is, claims to be already in, in 10% of its population in a wallet. Uh, and there are other countries in the world that are, are trying uh, these digital currencies in, in Europe as well. I would say that the big elephant in the room seems to be what is the U.S. going to do and when, when are they, when is the U.S. going to do anything about this? And I would, I would say that why it's, this question is interesting is because in a way, uh, you know, some folks, uh, I think it's, it's it, let's put it this way, I think it's, it's arguable that the, the lack that we don't, the lack of, the lack of a, of a official digital currency, if you want to call it that, it's really helping all this uh, other Wild West ecosystem, you know, no disrespect, I don't, I'm not, I don't, I'm not suggesting that all of these stable ones are, but they are certainly not an traditional system. I think a lot of folks, would, they really want basically a digital currency, a programmable money. They, they, they're not so attached to the, this has to be you know, government-free, tamper-free, censorship resistance from government. I think that is a different value prop. So by not rolling out, by not making this digital currencies available, I think uh, we're feeding in a way the growth of this other, which eventually people are concerned about their impact on uh, government's abilities to, to um, you know, do monetary policy, or even at some point, um, you know, controlling you know, certain, certain information about financial transactions. So I think this is, uh, I, th I believe um, the reasons, I don't know, I mean, I'm, I'm a relatively marginal student of this, but I would say, you know, it's fascinating in that, you know, think about the fact that a digital currency in your wallet would be like you having a, an account directly with the Fed, right? You're taking out the financial institution, which currently is in the middle and you can't have an IOU on, on, on the money you've deposited because that money has been lent on to somebody else to, to be precise. So at the end of the day, um, this is a higher quality of uh, better, it's kind of like having cash really in your, in your phone if you want, if we, let's, let's, let's stick to what we all sort of want to get at the end of the day is that, that money is, is in, our, in our pocket, right? So I think that's that's an issue that, they, that the uh, central banks are going to have to resolve. Uh, some folks are hinting at the idea that, you know, a digital wallet from a central bank may have a, an asset layer and a, or maybe put it this way, there could be in addition to an asset and a, read, uh, and a payment layer, there could be potentially um, a, a wholesale uh, structure, a wholesale infrastructure and a retail infrastructure. So you can have a place for the banks to, uh, to work and continue with the M2 or M1 uh, functionality they provide uh, this day and age. So those are the things that I would say around, it's tight. I know it's a, a very big picture, uh, but uh, it, it is hard to know what the uh, Federal Reserve Bank is doing. They, they're probably working on this, but they're not telling the world very much about what their plans are. <laughs> Larry, any other thoughts on just kind of the the CBDC piece and you know anything else to expect there? I, I tend to think, and I think you alluded to it, I, I tend to think that we'll, we'll probably see a central bank digital currency that looks a little bit more like what China and other countries have come up with at the wholesale level, but I don't see that at the retail level for a whole host of reasons, whether it's privacy or other. And given how far behind we are from China, I think the Fed can't afford to not roll out with something. 
there's been a lot of talk about regulating stable coins and making sure that they're back one for one. And it almost seems like they're kind of picking a couple of potential winners with stable coin with, with some of the regulatory guidance they're giving. I'm wondering if we'll see stable coins be used as kind of the de facto central bank digital currency at the retail level, basically a digital dollar, and it would have to be backed by US dollars and or treasury. And I don't see any problem in that outside of the fact that you know, there is some conversations about, you know, a lot of the talk is around, well, could there be a run on these digital dollars? I don't think that's really where the concern is because if the digital dollars have to be backed one for one, I think the concern probably is if there's a run on the banks, it might be exasperated by the fact that people could know they could go to their digital dollar because it has to be backed by law one to one. So I don't know. There's a there's a lot of uh, sticking points. I know there's a lot of conversations right now with Treasury and Fed and trying to figure out and give some guidance around stable coins, because I do believe the stable coins might ultimately end up be that de facto digital dollar for the U.S., at least at the retail level. And then that would that would ensure that you could still still have that layer of banks as intermediaries in between, and you could potentially do some fractional reserve banking. And what will be interesting is if they ultimately allow some of those underlying assets that the stable coins have to hold to be re-lent back out, because if they don't, you're tying up some of those dollars in stable coins. And, and we know how fractional reserve banking works. Uh, that doesn't work if you've got them tied up in stable coins. But um, you know, th there's a lot, lot, lot more questions than there are answers in this space. If I may chime in, I think that I would certainly encourage uh, the uh, central bankers to work on this. Particularly in the U.S., I think we have a lesson that uh, we, we, I think we should have learned, particularly we saw uh, with uh, the payment infrastructure, the, the let's say the non-crypto payment infrastructure, and we saw companies like Venmo um, come out of nowhere and just own such a large number of the retail transactionality. You know, Venmo is, is, uh, is a byproduct of the fact that, in, in a way, the mindset we have in the U.S. is that the central government should not enter a space where the private sector um, can develop uh, a solution. But truthfully, the, the banking sector did not deliver a solution. Natcha was unable to give us the same day payments, uh, real time payments, uh, I mean, one day payment for forever. And therefore it allowed for all this innovation, which is great uh, from the private sector, but it, it really is in the fringes. It's like, these are non-chartered institutions. For, uh, the history of Venmo is, it will tell us that Eventually, the Fed is rolling out Fed now, uh, which is a, a, a competing infrastructure for facilitating faster payments, which is what people in the 21st century want to have without using a check. And yet, uh, there was too much, too much waiting and you know, not letting the Fed play its role of providing uh, an infrastructure. I think it is ultimately an issue because I don't think we are seeing necessarily uh, the uh, at least from the banking sector, we're not seeing any competing ideas, and therefore, uh, you know, then they, uh, you know, we, you know, the issues that people are concerned, like what Larry is saying, you know, what, what if the, some of this uh, stable coins has an issue, a liquidity or a run, uh, who is to blame for? Technically, they're not FDIC insured money, so it's, you know, I always wonder, what, is it, is somebody not? Uh, but it's the traditional moral hazard problem. You know, it's like, you know, like, are the people that are supposed to be watching after this thing, why aren't they doing something about it? Even though the investors or the holders, they know this is not FDNC insured. So I don't know if you, the, the, the point is the lesson of Venmo and, you know, seven years later, uh, FedNow, FedNow could have been here, you know, at the same time as Venmo uh, or at the same time as Nacha was not be able to deliver that, that, that functionality. And, and I think by, by not uh, letting the public sector do the, their work here, or just, it's, it's probably not the best outcome. Right. No, that, that's, that's a great point. And, and certainly I think, you know, to kind of bring this full circle, uh, maybe one of the last things we want to cover today, um, and Larry, I know you've tracked this a little bit, is just to try to get a better feel for, you know, regulation in general, as it relates to cryptocurrency and kind of what the expectations are, are there. I mean, we've seen, you know, some um, updates from the president's working group on financial markets. I know that there was an OCC uh, report recently as well. So Larry, can maybe jump into that up for a few minutes and kind of help yeah, us I understand think, where we are? I think FAD also was in there. I mean, it, it, the regulation is coming fast and furious. 
but you know, and that's not necessarily a bad thing as long as it's good uh, regulation and good regulatory guidance, because we don't we don't want to stifle the innovation of the U.S. Um, that ha that could have happened back with the internet. There's some talk about that we didn't stifle that innovation. We ended up in Silicon Valley, so we have the same opportunity with cryptocurrencies to give smart guidance, but not to stifle that innovation and and, and find those that talent to go elsewhere. But um, in terms of the President's Working Group on Financial Markets, that was released, I want to say two weeks ago, that was uh, really run by the Treasury, Federal Reserve, uh, Security Exchange Commission, CFTC, the Commodity Future Trade you know, Commission, all participated. Uh, FDIC was also involved in that, as well as the OCC, and they released their report on stable coins. And this was really to address risks to the payments uh, to payment stable coins. So agencies recommended that Congress would act promptly to enact legislation to ensure that payment stable coins and payment stable coin arrangements are subject to a federal framework on a consistent and comprehensive basis. So a couple of things, key things that came out of this, you know, the one they're asking Congress to provide the guidance. Uh, they essentially said they'll step in if Congress doesn't do something. Uh, they said legislation should require custodial wallet providers to be subject to federal oversight. So those would be the exchanges. Uh, legislation should require stable coin issuers to comply with activity restrictions that limit affiliation to commercial entities. And I think that was a slight on Facebook's DM, uh, previous Libra. In fact, this morning I saw someone sent me a, a news article that uh, Libra DM's creator, Mark, uh, David Marcus, who I've seen a bunch of interviews, very bright gentleman, says he's leaving Facebook slash Meta at year end. So this does not speak too well to DM's future in their wallet, Novi. Um, I was real excited about to see where that went. But, uh, but that recommendation from President's Working Group to, again, limit affiliation with commercial entities, I think was a clear signal that they were not going to be supporting uh, Facebook's or, or, or Meta's efforts around that. Um, also said to address the risk to stablecoin users and guard against stablecoin runs, legislation should require stablecoin issuers to be insured deposit institutions. So I'd presume that could be either banks or credit unions because credit unions uh, insured by the NCUA and the, obviously FDIC for uh, banks. What's interesting there, again, I kind of question why would that be, if, if you by law are going to require stable coins to be back one for one, what do you care whether it's at a federally insured institution? Unless your plan is to later uh, lend those out on a fractional reserve basis, which you might be, um, and then you wouldn't need to, uh, FDIC. The only other thing I can surmise is that just an FDIC insured or a CUA insured institution should have the compliance structure in place that you know, it might guard against any sort of runs or issues with stable coins. But that's another one that for me just sits a little funny. And then I think finally, um, one of the things that they said was US dollar based stable coin arrangements should hold high quality US dollar denominated assets hold those assets at US regulatory, regulated entities and utilize multiple custodians and secure investments with high quality obligators. So that to me says that, you know, I think they are looking to use that as a de facto central bank digital currency. Uh, you can back it by US dollars or you could back it by US treasury, uh, which is probably similar to what a central bank digital currency would be backed by. But uh, Manola, I don't know if you've got any other thoughts on that. Um, in terms of the president's working group, I know there was also an OCC letter, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. No, I think the unhosted wallets is really what I think. You know, we, we haven't talked about DeFi uh, yet, but I think there's there's a great deal of functionality that uh, can be processed right now. And having hosted wallets that have no identity attached to them may be an issue, and that's the international guidance as well. And exploring ways to really get that. Um, uh, you know, register, which creates a, you know, a, a new wave of options as well for, for the uh, crypto world itself. I, uh, I totally agree. Um, going back to the OCC letter. So last week we did get another interpretive letter from the new head of the OCC, or, or the interim head of the OCC. Uh, three interpretive letters had been provided prior to this recent administration that really allowed banks to dip their toes into cryptocurrencies. This latest one 
kind of clarified those initial letters and basically said now that banks should not engage in activities until it receives written notification from the supervisory's office of non-objection. So what they're essentially saying is they want you to ask permission, not forgiveness, which I think is fair. They want to make sure that uh, I don't think it's a hard no. They just want to make sure that the right um, compliance regulatory oversight structures are in place to comply with Bank Secrecy Act and Know Your Client, Customer and all of those activities. So I think it's a fair request. It, it is encouraging it that they did not say no. Um, and I do expect similar guidance to be coming from the NCUA. We've had some conversations with them. And I think uh, maybe by the end of this year, certainly first quarter of next year, we'll probably see similar sort of guidance as what the OCC gave banks. And we'll see credit unions further dip their toes into uh, the cryptocurrency currents. Well, that's great. And, and thanks for covering off on that, Larry. And it sounds like there's there's lots more that we could talk about, right, in these conversations, and uh, including DeFi and some other elements of uh, the, the bigger picture here. But I think for today, uh, we'll probably kind of just bring this back around and just want to say thank you both for a very fascinating conversation, great info, um, just great stuff all around. So thank you both. Um, and as a programming note, you know, we're just asking folks to keep an eye out on SRM social media. And uh, we've got a uh, our next webinar coming up in our cryptocurrent series that Larry will be hosting that takes place on December 14th. And the topic will actually be a deep dive, deep dive into stable coins, something we talked about today. Uh, so we hope folks will be able to join us for that. And uh, Manolo, thank you again for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate your insights on this. And hopefully we can have a second conversation, uh, dive into some of the other topics that we know are going to continue to be of interest to folks uh, in our audience and beyond. So uh, Really appreciate your time uh, and willingness to have the conversation today. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. it. Manola, it was a uh, it was a real pleasure and honor to be on a, a discussion with you. So thank you. Likewise, Larry. It's, it's, it's a great opportunity for us to uh, compare notes. Right. Thank you.